us tonight. Um, before we start tonight in earnest, I mean, you saw a little bit of what we've been up to. Um, we just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the horrific shooting that happened in Texas yesterday, in which at least 21 people were killed. Um, we're here to celebrate the achievements of the class of 2022, um, but it does feel like we need to just pause for a second and think about that, because this class really has been about seeing the world as it is, um, beginning to imagine what it might be, and, and beginning to create a world that's more just and equitable. So we'll just pause here for a second. Thank you. Um, I'm Matt Callahan. I'm the Associate Director of the Scott Center for Social Entrepreneurship. I'm also one of the co-teachers for Social Impact and Leadership. Um, so this event is the culmination of a significant effort, a year-long effort from the eighth grade class. Um, as you just saw, there's um, a lot that this class cares about, a lot of different things, um, and they do care a lot about those things. Um, they care enough to do something about it. So um, it's really um, sort of hackneyed at this point to say that, um, that the past few years have been difficult, right? Um, for all of us, it's been devastating for many. Um, and yet the past two years have been really incredible for us here at Hillbrook in the, in the sense that we're able to create something new um, out of a structure that already existed. And um, we were approached in the, in the summer of 2020 with the task of creating this course. And um, you know we didn't know how we were gonna create something that was an evolution of a, of a capstone course that already existed. Um, and we also wanted to do it in partnership with the Scott Center for Social Entrepreneurship. So, um, we got a chance to run a pilot class last year, and then this year we got a chance to refine that course. Um, and also balance that with the return to like a quote-unquote normal schedule. It was a bumpy ride, but you know, we're all here now and the students um, are all the better for it, and so are we. Um, we had a chance to take what we knew works, which is connecting student interest with their skill sets, and then the tools that we have in this amazing space and others. Um, and then have them begin to address a need or an issue that exists in the world. And the students jumped in really on day one um, with really thoughtful questions. They participated enthusiastically and they generated some great ideas. Um, eighth graders, I don't know if you remember the um, amazing idea that Alicia and Estelle came up with to retexture a world in Animal Crossing to make people experience the BP oil spill virtually. That impressed us from, from day one. Um, but early on, we asked them the core questions of the Scott Center. What matters to you, and what are you doing about it? For many of them, it wasn't that they didn't have anything that they cared about, it's that they cared about a lot of different things, and it was hard to narrow it down to one thing. So we did a lot of exercises to zero in on the projects, and they had um, a lot of help from their mentors. But each student here today has spent significant time thinking about their issue, researching the background and the causes of that issue, and creating a response that's unique to their background and their skill set. Following our opening remarks, you'll be hearing each student briefly summarize their project in about five minutes. And those five minutes sum up a process that took many hours, many months to complete. Focusing on process over product, we asked the students to design, iterate, revise, problem solve, organize, communicate, and collaborate. What might not be evident in these presentations are the tireless hours the students spent conducting interviews, formatting text, tweaking drawings, testing prototypes, gluing, and painting. What we also witnessed behind the scenes was significant peer support and collaboration. Students helped each other build structures, offered feedback on presentations, and thought of solutions as challenges rose, arose. While these impact projects are clearly independent culminating pieces of work, they are the result of much collaboration and communication among students and mentors. We have a couple quick thank yous to make. Um, we're so grateful for the ways that this community has supported this class. Thank you to those who have donated time, talent, and treasure, which showed up in so many ways throughout the year. Giving your time to the students, facilitating an introduction, or giving to the Scott Center. Your contributions continue to feed the mission and vision of this work on and off campus. Thank you to the mentors of our students. Over 20 faculty and administrators helped support our students' projects. And many mentors worked with two or three students through the project. Thank you for following up and for being patient. 
Thank you for learning alongside our students in the middle of your busy schedules. And thank you to the families of our students who patiently and graciously listened to their students or who didn't hear anything about the projects until possibly tonight. Thank you for your gift of trust with your students and your time tonight. A big thanks to the administration for creating space for this class to continue for another year and for providing material, moral, and logistical support. And thank you most of all to the students of the class of 2022 who put their time and effort into these projects. I hope that these efforts are their own reward and that you will look back on this time as a gift to pursue, some, pursue something that intersects your passion for something that's a real need in this world. I can't think of anything better than that kind of work. So some logistics. Um, when you came in, you should have had a program or seen some programs around. If you haven't gotten one, we'll get you one. Um, those have the schedule for this evening and a description of every project. Um, we're gonna have, I think, four, hopefully, um, keynote addresses tonight. Um, and so we'll all stay in this space for the keynote addresses. Um, after those, you'll head out to a breakout space um, to hear of a, a variety of projects. You'll probably, you know, you probably came to hear uh, one specific student's project. You'll hear that student and a couple others in that breakout space. There are maps posted around the campus and we can also um, direct you. There's lots of adults here that can direct you to the room um, in which your student will speak. After the formal presentations, um, we will come back to this area. There's actually a patio out there and there's going to be an informal Q&A sort of session with all of the students. So if you didn't see one student and you wanted to see their presentation or learn about their project, there'll be another opportunity out on the patio here for you to just informally ask some questions and see the presentations or the, or the project. And then um, we'll conclude back out on that patio with a few words and some refreshments. Um, thanks to seventh grader Orly Jones, who is providing tonight's refreshments. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, here is that map that I wanted to show. Um, these are posted all over the place, so you don't need to like look at this in detail, but um, we can also direct you to where you're going. And without further ado, we're gonna hear from some keynote presenters. So um, we're gonna hear first from Oliver, and um, after that, we'll hear from Soraya, and then Anata, and Estelle. Hello everyone, today I will be talking about my financial foundations. First, we'll be going over the backgrounds. I'm in eighth grade and I've been at Hillbrook since kindergarten. I first got into finance when I was in about fourth grade. I got money for my birthday and I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't have anything to buy and I didn't want it to just sit in the bank. So instead, I asked my uncle, who was an analyst at the time, what I should do with it. He suggested I invested it in an ETF. At the time, I was unaware what, I was, what an ETF was or even what a stock was. Ever since then, I've been interested in making a financial literacy course so no adults or kids feel what I felt. So here's my issue. Financial education creates confidence for kids and adults. Everyone deserves this opportunity to learn more about how money works and how we can use it as a tool. Here's the research I did based on my issue. I, my first step was to just look on the internet for some studies. I came across this one by the National Financial Educators Council. It gave a, uh, a test to some age groups and the score they got. A 70% is a passing grade on this test. So the average 15 to 18 year old scored just above 16%, or 60%, sorry. The average 19 to 24 year old was just shy of 70. The average 25 to 35 year old was around 75%. A 12 year old who took my plan scored 30, 70, sorry, 73%. Now I'm gonna share with you 10 shocking facts. 50, 53% of adults are financially anxious. Two in three families lack an emergency fund. 78% of adults live paycheck to paycheck. Three in five adults don't keep a budget. Four in five youths failed a financial literacy quiz. 
27 states scored a C, D, or F on a high school financial literacy quiz. 54% of millennials are concerned about student loans. 60% of adults have had credit card debt in the past year. Four in five adults experience barriers to home ownership. And finally, fewer than one in five adults are confident in savings. With all this research that I did, I tried to just get a problem and then a solution that I came up with. So my problem was huge sections of our society have never been educated in financial literacy, which means they cannot save, invest, or multiply their money. The solution I came up with was make learning about financial literacy part of mainstream education. Here's the process that I went through to do that. Step one, talk to mentors and talk to people like teachers who have made many successful lesson plans before. Step two was just to create the first version of the lesson plan. And step three, thanks to my mentor, Ms. Mack, I was able to get a Reach Beyond block and practice teaching my plan and see how the students received it. That was step four. And step five, which I'm currently working on, which I'm currently working on, is share the plan with anyone who wants it. So this is, these are some photos of me um, giving the plan. And um, this was the fifth and sixth graders, which fifth and sixth graders is who my plan is targeted to. And one thing that was great about doing this, uh, giving this plan, was my whole life I've been a student receiving the plan. And now I'm the teacher creating the plan. So I have the opportunity to do what I love when teachers do, which is listen to the students. I created a form and gave it to all of the students who took my plan and they filled it out and gave it back to me, and it, it told me what they wanted to improve, with what I, what I should improve with my lesson plan. This included adding, a photo, adding more photos, making, making more, like, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, for me to talk less, and for them to work, work together more. So what I did was add a photo on every slide, and I added multiple videos in addition to making sure I only talked for half the time and the other half the time the students would either be working together or watching a video. This insight I have gained allowed me to make this one-of-a-kind plan which students love. Here's what a sixth grader had to say about my financial foundations lesson plan. The research in stocks was so interesting and learning about supply and demand really changed how I think about the world. Here is the outcome. So what Financial Foundation offers for anyone who wants it is the lesson plan, which is three parts, which are for 30 to 45 minutes each, a teacher guide, which tells teachers what to do on each and every slide, a website, which anyone in the world can access, and then over 500 pages of reading if any students would like to continue their learning. So why should you choose Financial Foundations? Well, it is very interactive, educational, it is proven to work, highly visual, and then offers the next steps. The money I invested in fourth grade is still in the market, and I enjoy, enjoy watching it grow, and I know that I will be able to use it to grow my future. Finally, I am so thankful I learned the basics about finance when I was younger, and I think every student should get the opportunity to do the same. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Soraya. Hello, and welcome to my Social Impact and Leadership Project. My name is Soraya Hansen, and climate change is an issue that matters to me. My project responds to the issue of climate change, and I chose this topic for two main reasons. The first was that I wanted to challenge myself and delve into a topic that I didn't know much about. And then the second is that I feel that this issue is one that affects kind of all aspects of life, from people to animals and nature. So for example, 800 million people are currently vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And since this is a man-made problem, I believe that we should take every step we can to help. For my project, I thought, what if I was able to build and install solar panels to a treehouse which I built with my dad last summer? To help reduce the impact of climate change, solar energy is a great renewable source of energy. However, if, 
However, I, I find that many people are very intimidated by it. And then this is why I decided to film my process and create a documentary in the hopes of making, in the hopes of showing everyone how accessible solar energy is. And then something else that I also loved about this project was how I was able to draw upon different class disciplines. So for example, I was able to use a lot of science and math. And then one of my first steps was researching, and I started out by, t by sketching a diagram of what my solar system would work and how I was eventually gonna connect it to my tree house. So my next step was researching, and so I needed to see what type of solar panels to use, what camera to get, and what batteries to get. And then I ended up using a GoPro camera, monocrystalline solar panels, and I used Renogy Tech for the batteries, charge controller, inverter, and wire. And then to explain the usage of the different elements, the solar panels charge the batteries and the charge controllers control how much energy is going from the solar panels to the batteries. And then the inverter converts the DC current from the battery to an AC current, which works for everyday plugs and outlets. And then as I mentioned, I use a lot of math for this project. So first I calculated the daily usage and I thought about what appliances I could hypothetically fit in my treehouse. So for example, like a coffee machine or a TV. And then I used that to see what type of, what size of solar panel system I would need. And then I grouped my project into four main steps. So the first step was to build and install the solar panels. Um, and then while I was doing that, I was able to do my second step, which was filming and documenting my process. And then my third step was to take all the clips that I'd gotten and record and edit it into a documentary. And then my final step was to put together my final presentation. And then my mentor was Mr. Stamos and he helped guide me through the filming and editing process. And then my dad also helped with the construction and kind of installation process. And so here's my final product and I'll just talk through the pictures quickly. So the first image is of the inside of the shed that we built it on, and this kind of shows the internal wiring and then like the inverter and the batteries. And then those second two steps are images of the solar panels. And then you'll notice that the solar panels aren't yet on my treehouse, as that is the final step that I did not get to do yet in our time frame. but my plan is to connect them by the end of summer. And then here is a link to my final documentary, which illustrates my process of researching and installing the solar panels. And I hope that people will feel inspired to move to solar, which will then lead to less solar, which will then lead to less fossil fuels. And then I wanted to thank my mentor for helping with the filming and editing process, Mr. Stamos, my dad for helping with the installation process, my SIL teachers, Ms. Maisel and Mr. C for guiding me throughout this project, and Ms. Hammers for helping coach me through my presentation. And I'm also really grateful for this project as I was able to learn more about solar energy, and it also helped reinforce my time management skills, which I know will be helpful in high school. And then if you're looking for me this summer, chances are that, I'll be, that you can find me watching Netflix in my solar panel tree house. Thank you for listening to my presentation. And I'm here to talk about my SLR project, Climate and Mental. For those who don't know me, I'm a 14-year-old and an eighth grader at Hillbrook. So I've been here from JK, which is 10 years. Before we talk about my project, let me ask some simple questions. So who here is thinking about not being able to water their lawns? Raise your hands if you think about that. All right. Who here is worried about the drought? Who here is concerned about the air quality? Who here is scared of wildfires? <laughs> now, on a not so simple topic, who here is worried about climate change? Based on the show of hands, climate change is clearly a topic on a lot of people's minds, including mine. So that's the issue. I'm here today to show my studies on the correlation between climate change and mental health. Personally, climate change is an issue 
that weighs on my mind quite a bit as I'm worried about my future in this world. So, what did I do? Well, as mentioned before, I conducted a study. I designed research questions and predictions about the climate, uh, impact of climate change on the mental health of two populations found here at Hillbrook. The first population being the Hillbrook faculty, such as our teachers over here, and the seventh and eighth graders, which is you know, us. <laughs> this study yielded some good results and plenty of data. But what did I do with this data? Well, I created a podcast about the effects of climate change on mental health. Research. Well, before I, wanna, before I make my podcast, I want to slow down and research my actual question about how climate change can affect mental health. So I spent some time in class looking at a report and studies conducted by actual scientists. My research online found that climate change has the following effects. Mild stress, high risk coping behavior, such as drinking, which is not good, <laughs> and mental disorders, such as depression, anxiety, and possibly PTSD. Thanks, Joe. Pretty serious stuff, right? <laughs> and this isn't just a local problem. Climate change is imp impacting people all over the world. Down in Australia, in a newspaper titled The Age, journalist Catelyn uh, Fitzsimon tells her readers, let's not pretend that children and teenagers can't understand what's going on. She reports that 86% of Australia's surveyed teens view climate change as a threat to their safety. Traveling up in Paris, David R. Boyd, UN special uh, reporter on human rights and the environment, said that when the initial UN convention on climate change was signed in 1992, about, about four-fifths of the world's energy supply came from fossil fuels, and that share has not dropped since. Here's a quote from him. Children, I apologize to you from the bottom of my heart. We are failing you. And I would talk about USA and Brazil, but it's too much time. <laughs> the process. So that's what people all over the globe are doing. So how did I create my podcast? I surveyed 34 adults and 34 students recorded my predictions, and analyzed my results. In my study, I uh, considered the following questions. Would Hillbrook adults or students report feeling more negatively affected by climate change? What events would subjects feel were most evident of personal impact of climate change? And would adults' self-reported political leaning or status as a parent correlate with the reported effects? I sent these questions, uh, I created two, uh, two Google Forms, and I sent them out, one to faculty and one to the uh, students. After collecting my data, I was able to put together two podcast episodes, episode one being my predictions, and episode two being my results and analysis. I created a script, as you can see on the screen, for both. Well, although the script for number episode two was only key factors. To further deepen my analysis, I interviewed Hillbrook science teacher Brian Revisa in the back. I had him. Hey, Mr. Revisa. We discussed his experiences and his personal effects efforts to combat climate change. After reporting Mr. Revisa, I took his audio files and the ones I already re recorded and downloaded them into GarageBand, where I put them together the actual episodes, as well as making an, op an opening song and ending song. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Suck. I'm excited. Now, my favorite part of the presentation, the data. Oh, I don't like this part. <laughs> All right, here's a question. Have you been affected by recent climate change events? Here we can see the seventh and eighth grade students and Hilbert faculty. Pretty different, right? Hilbert faculty, uh, faculty 94.1% said yes, they have. Well, the rest said no. No one said unsure. Well, for students, 38.2% said unsure, while 32.4% uh, said yes, and 29.4% said no. I, I, uh, um, the way I interpret this is that the issue is too big for people like me, because we don't have much power in this world, and we can't really understand, well, I can understand, but it's just hard to do anything about climate change. All right. <laughs> How often do you think about climate change? Some grade students and eighth grade students and faculty. Here we see that sometimes, uh, for students, 50% say sometimes, 
while only 11.8 say often. Well, for faculty, 47.1 uh, say sometimes, while 38.2 say often. I think this shows that our students kind of have more to think about in life, because, well, so do adults, but like, we have to, <laughs> we have to, we have, to uh, we have to learn, do our homework, study, and keep relationships while trying to save the, our current world and the future we have. You laughing at me, Estelle? <laughs> How have global climate change uh, events affected your mental health? This is a more important data. Okay, seventh and eighth students, 15 people of the other results said they, were, they did not affect at all. Well, 10 said somewhat affected, and two and six said uh, a negative effect. For faculty, 20, which is a lot, <laughs> said that it was somewhat negatively affected. Uh, seven said negatively affected. Four said didn't affect, and the other two just on the way positive. Uh, here's a quote from the, uh, the, uh, the results I got. When, when the wildfires were ongoing and severe, my mental health was significantly impacted. Here's a quote from the students. It's not like I don't care. It's just something I'm not focused on. Personally, I agree with this because I do care about climate change and my future, but I'm also, there's a lot of other things to think about in my life. My conclusion, well, what I'm trying, what I'm trying to get across here is that climate change is a real and is something our generations and generations in the future we'll have to deal with. Climate change is affecting people everywhere, not just with warmer temperatures, as I'm sure we've all affected, uh, experienced in the last few days with the hot days, <laughs> with, uh, rising flood waters, a lack of water, and wildfires, but by stress and mental disorders. As an eighth grader, it would be easy to feel helpless, but I choose to be hopeful. I believe that the efforts made by my peers, teachers, and myself can make a, di a positive difference by starting with small changes. These small changes, no matter how small, will contribute to this global issue that ev if everyone pitches in. So remember in the beginning, I started by asking a series of questions. Let me end by asking one more. What are you gonna do about climate change? And special thanks. Uh, thank you to my SL teachers, Ms. Maisel, uh, Ms. Eden Maisel and Mr. Matthew Callahan. Thank you to my mentor, a mentor where, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Ilsa Doman. Thank you to Mr. Brian Revisa to let me interview him. And also a, a thank you to uh, Ms. Mary Hammers. Is she here? I, uh, for helping uh, us, all of us keynote speakers with our uh, presentations. And a big thank you to you, the audience, for listening and interacting with my presentation. Have a wonderful night. This is a Nada Chung Toad signing off. In terms of your personal skill set, in terms of your personal passions, instead of letting the anxiety of all of these issues kind of overwhelm you, 
what is the one thing that you can start to do to begin to respond to in this moment? And yeah, maybe that leads to like... Clean water for all. Mental health. Coral bleaching. Water crisis. Internet privacy and security. Cycling plastic from the ocean. Partnership. Rising sea levels. Clean water. Mental health. Reducing inequalities. Surfing sustainably. Reducing inequalities. Life on land. Climate change. We're using and recycling our waste. Responsible consumption and production. Light pollution. Gender equality. Food insecurity. Solar energy. Financial literacy. Plastic pollution. Athletes' well-being. Food waste. Homelessness. Ocean plastic pollution. Carbon emissions. Responsible consumption and production. Solar power. Marine pollution.
and all they have to see that right there and give a presentation to all of their classmates and all of the parents, all four of the children doing a good job. Um, so these presentations and the work we've been doing over the last four, five, six years all comes from two very simple questions. What matters to you and what are you going to do about it? Um, and I'll, I'll follow Anada's lead, although you don't actually have to raise your hand, but I suspect that as adults in this room, we don't ask ourselves that question very often. I know that these students have been thinking a lot about that question and the, what these topics, and you'll hear such a broad range of topics tonight, but they're all things that have personal meaning to them and they're real issues. As you heard from the four students that we just talked about, these are really important, big issues and they're learning about them and they're learning about resources that are out there. They're doing highly academic work, reading, researching, creating. There's so much that happens through these projects. And so I hope that as you go through the night, you have an opportunity to, you won't hear all of them, but you'll hear a, a, a portion of them. And I hope as you listen to them, you think about how impressive it is that you have these 13 and 14 year olds asking these really big questions and coming back with some really interesting responses. One of the things that I loved, several of them noted, was it's, there's a sense of hope, right? Like these are big, complicated problems. It's easy to get overwhelmed. You know, Nada, you said that a couple of times, right? It's pretty easy to get overwhelmed by this issue. And at the same time, we're empowering them and they're paying attention to ways in which they can make a difference. And that is our hope um, as they're leaving Hillbrook. So I am going to follow Oliver's advice, which is to talk less. Um, and uh, just again, if we just give all of them a huge round of applause. And I'm going to turn it over to Matt, who wants to say a few words before you head off to classrooms. Awesome. Um, all right. So, uh, one quick thing that I wanted to mention um, actually, Eden brought it to, to my mind. Um, we have a website where all of these projects will be posted. So, you know, there'll be a chance for you to see these again. There's a, you've seen links, you've seen booklets, you've seen QR codes, you've seen videos. All of that will be online and, you know, give us a couple days. It takes a little bit to get them from the students and onto the website, but it will all be there and we'll send out a, a follow-up email with all of that information. Um, I wanted to put this up. Um, so right now we are headed into the formal presentation time. Um, and that will go, let's see, we're, I think we're two minutes behind schedule.